Well, sisters and brothers in Christ, grace to you and peace from God, our creator, and Jesus Christ, who justifies and sets us free. Amen. A few weeks ago, the other pastor, Semler Smith, preached a sermon about the Trinity. And in it, he likened the relationship among the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to a dance, a dance of equal divine partners. To begin with, Pastor Brom did admit that when on the dance floor, he does have two left feet, which was very honest of him. But then he led us through an exploration of the nature of God using this metaphor of movement and dance and relationship. But perhaps by no fault of his own, because he is a he after all, he didn't quite go all the way I wanted him to go with that dance metaphor. That is, what it feels like and the choice you have when someone invites you to dance. So the year is 2006. I was studying liberation theology in Mexico City with a group from Luther Seminary. When we spent our, most of our days, they were immersed in the local culture. We would visit Christian-based communities and the like, but our evenings, they were free. And so one evening, a group of six of us, ladies and gents, decided to take in some local culture, which in Mexico City meant dancing. And so we walked into this small establishment, which from the outside was not much to look at, but inside it was alive with music and conversations and a lot of moving bodies. And so we future pastors found a table where we could enjoy our cerveza close enough to see the action but safe enough distance from the main activity. But apparently it wasn't far enough because out of nowhere a nice looking young latino man comes up to our table smiles his half smile and asks me bailas conmigo at that moment my two years of high school spanish my two years of college spanish really weren't kicking in but i knew what the outstretched arm the smile and the extended hand meant it was an invitation to not just observe the action and believe it was thrilling, but to actually trust the stranger and join the dance. The proposition was exhilarating and terrifying at the same time. We'll see how that ended up a little bit later here. As we continue to study the letter to Galatians, one of Paul's main emphasis that continues to come through is that God's grace is a free gift. It's God who makes that first move to claim us without any preconditions, any rules to belong. Through Christ, God literally holds out the divine hand and offers us to dance within the relationship of the Trinity, inviting us to know the healing, forgiveness, and abundant life possible therein. But the questions that Galatian begs of us today is whether or not we will take God up on that gamble of grace. Do we accept the offer to get out on the dance floor, to trust God in a way that is more than just believing with our heads, but actually doing God's will through our decisions and actions? If God is not a tame God, and God isn't, to take that gamble would require us to have no small amount of faith. But Paul says this, a person is justified, not by the works of the law, but through the faith of Jesus Christ. There it is, faith. But before we dig into the nature of what Paul was saying there, we can't miss another word in that phrase. It's like a speed bump if we, if we don't spend time on it. That's justification. Justification. It's a loaded, churchy word. When you hear it, perhaps you think uh, how we use it today. So-and-so was justified or not in their actions or their words, as in a person was right in what they did or said. It was reasonable. But for Paul and other Jewish Christians at the time, the concept of justification was bigger than individuals being in the right. It had to do with ultimately getting the covenant community back into right relationship with their creator. After losing the temple and the land, experiencing oppression after oppression under foreign powers, the Jewish people, Paul included, looked for the day when God's vision for God's people would be restored, 
setting all things back into balance, like pulling the divine vision for the world finally back into focus. Paul claims that this justification, the healing of the God-human relationship, has already begun through Christ and through his faithfulness. Christ's ability to trust is what led him to not only listen for the will of the creator in his life, but to follow it all the way to death. And in the cross, Christ accomplished two things. First, Christ showed all people what the relationship between God and humans was meant to be. That is, one of whole life trust. And then by his death and resurrection, Christ then became available in power to help people have that same kind of trust in God. This justification, the making right of the relationship between God and humans, began in human, in Jesus, and has continued throughout the ages, and will continue until one day all things will be made new. The cross was this radical, self-giving, sacrificial act. For God, justification came with a high price. But then the grace that resulted cost us nothing. Theologian and author Marcus Borgs warns, though, that this is where we need to be careful. There's no such thing as a free gift, Borg asserts, really. There can only be a free offer, which becomes a gift when it is accepted. Just let that mull around for a minute. There is no such thing as a free offer, but rather it becomes a free gift when it is accepted. If Borg is right, it means that God's grace is a little bit like the air that we breathe. It's always and equally available for everyone in any normal place or time. We do nothing to obtain it, nothing to merit it. It's there unconditionally for the good and the bad. Indeed, we hardly notice the air unless something goes wrong with us. Air, however, is a free offer that only becomes a free gift when we accept it and cooperate with it. We are always free to either take in too little air and choke or take in too much and hyperventilate. For air to be a gift, it has to be a matter of collaboration and participation in what is already there and everywhere. So if the free offer becomes a gift when it's accepted, the question is, will you breathe in the life-giving presence and grace of God? Or to get back to that original metaphor, will you get up from the corner table and dare to dance with the God who knows how you are meant to move? I would say it's fair to say that our nation is experiencing somewhat of a trust crisis. Why don't children walk to school anymore? And why has the ownership of guns skyrocketed these past decades? Whichever party you lean towards, trust determines what will happen in the ballot box. A sense of trust or mistrust can be the making or breaking of relationships with our neighbors, coworkers, friends, and families. And these are with people we can see. Trust takes years to build, seconds to break, and it is hard. So how about when this invisible God asks us to trust in his grace and then not only just believe in our heads, but then follow his lead across the dance floor of our every day? That's even harder. But there's two things about trusting God that I'll leave you with today. I think that God gives us trust as a gift, but I also think trust is something that we can cultivate. We can grow trust. So we know that the best relationships take time to build, don't they? Moment after moment, getting to know one another, conversing, listening, showing up for one another year after year until literally maybe you've met someone in whose life you would depend on or trust. So what happens if we don't give God the time to show up to us day by day, year after year? Is it at all surprising then that faith might have very little to do, little to do with the decisions we make in our lives, small or large? So here's the challenge for this week. What would it look like for you to trust God with seven minutes a day this week? That's 420 seconds out of 24 hours. 
Open a devotional. Write your thoughts of your prayers in a journal. Just sit in silence or listen to music. Flex your trust muscle minutes at a time. Invest in this relationship that could make all the difference. But as you do that, remember, number two, that trust is also ultimately a gift. As Paul says about himself, he says, I have been crucified with Christ and is no longer the I that live, but Christ in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So even the great apostle Paul asserts that his faith comes from none other than Christ's faith living in him. You are not alone in learning to trust God. Christ will come alongside and within you and gift you with his ability to be faithful. And then the prayer becomes, Christ, give me your faith to be more faithful. Christ is there to teach you to dance with God, a free-flowing, liberated, get-down-like-no-one's-watching, joyful response to grace. Move to the music of your life. So all those years ago in Mexico City, I wish that I could say that I would have made Ginger Rogers proud. Remember, she did everything Fred Astaire did, but backwards and wearing high heels. But alas... The St. Olaf dance lessons didn't kick in for me either. I didn't know if I was doing the cha-cha, the polka, or the salsa, and my northern European hips could not catch that rhythm to the point where that dear young Latino man danced me back to my seat and said, gracias. (laughs) And I sat back down in the safety of my classmates who were bent over knee-slapping, laughing at me. But I didn't regret that dance. And I don't think any of us will be sorry when we answer the invitation to enter the dance, taking the chance to trust the one who is ultimately trustworthy, to dance with God through the slow songs, the sad songs, the joyful and the painful ones. God's grace will be there, a free offer, awaiting to become a gift for your soul. Amen.